<laughs> Yay, we're here. <laughs> Maybe take the time to um, say hi to each other on the different quilt pages. Hey. Oh. Hello. Jesse, can you hear me? Yeah. Can you yeah. hear me? No. Can you hear me? Yeah. No. Can you okay. hear me? Uh, oh, oh, oh. Can you hear me, Michelle? I can hear you, but can you hear me? <laughs> Yes. Okay, great. Okay. <laughs> you weren't answering Jesse. He asked if you could hear him. I can't hear Jesse. I how about oh, now? Now I can. Yeah. Okay, wonderful. <laughs> There's a little bell that's going off each time somebody comes in. Do I do anything about that's that? That's just the the host can hear that. Um okay. so we have a sense of that and I, okay. I can't turn it okay. off at this point. <laughs> Don't worry. I thought something was wrong with my machine. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> I was looking all over trying to turn the volume <laughs> down. <laughs> no, that won't work. Mm. So uh, welcome, friends. Um, it's really wonderful to have you here. I'm sure folks will continue to um, arrive as uh, time moves forward. Um, but just, um, you know, really wanted to thank uh, everyone for showing up right now, those who've been able to participate on the Zoom over the last, you know, it ends up being, it's funny, a day is 24 hours, but a global date is more like 48 hours in terms of when it starts. And so um, it's just been awesome to have the Zoom open and have small and larger groups of people coming and sitting in silence and um, just connecting with one another around this time, I know that, that many of us feel very, you know, deeply concerned um, uh, about what's happening in Myanmar and Burma. Um, of course, we, you know, those of us, those of you who know us at Vipassana Hawaii and are familiar with our teachings and maybe come to some of the Sunday sittings, of course, have a sense, you know, that we, we go every year as a long, deep relationship, particularly with one community. Um, uh, in the Sagaing area of Burma. Um, and that that re retreat we've been running and programs we've been running, um, kind of aid programs have been going on for about 25 years now. And uh, Steve has been v visiting and practicing and you know ordained there for much longer than that. So, you know, it's 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 a very difficult time, you know, for many of us. It's amazing to be able to be in touch with some of our friends and to you know, be connected during this time when the internet is available. And right now it's not, they're in a, a total blackout um, government imposed um, right at this point, though they expect it'll come back in a few hours um, according to you know, announcements and rumors and all of that. But it's, it's, a, it's a very hard time and it's a hard time to um, get bits of news that you know, you're not sure what's true and what's not. Um, but when this first, when the coup first happened, um, you know, we got on a Zoom uh, call with a few friends who also have a deep connection to, to Burma, a couple of folks who are there, just trying to get a little bit more sense of what's happening, you know, on the ground. And um, even that's very difficult because of COVID, people are very cloistered and this, you know, um, these friends who we were speaking with, they were very cloistered already for the last year, you know, and so it was very, um, hard, I think, for a lot of people to get a sense of what's going on in the bigger picture now because of social media, because people are in the streets, there's a broader sense and shared sense of what's happening across the country and how inspiring it is, how moving it is. Um, and we've just been trying to understand what's our role, you know, as, as people who are part of a lineage that's out of, out of Burma and, um, you know, deeply indebted to people and the cultural roots of this tradition. 
um, and to relationships we have, um, trying to figure out, you know, what what's the most important, what's the most vital um, and useful things we can do. And so while, you know, if you've looked at the website, you can see that there, we're, not, we're still not clear in terms of what practical role we can start to take in terms of, you know, helping the movement in, um, on the ground. In fact, even the normal things that we tend to fund and support in Burma right now, it's a little bit on hold because there's, it's not clear how good an idea it is actually to, to wire money into the banks and who has access to what funds. And um, so there's just this sort of freeze happening, but, but someone on the ground said, you know, it really, there's one part of it that just matters that like we know that people are watching and we know what people care and we know people are, are tuning in and um, kind of honoring this lineage, honoring the connection as much as possible. So if we could do, a, you know, have Meta be practiced by people around the world, that would be really helpful. And so we did decided to do this, um, you know, day of, of practice of loving kindness for the people of Burma, um, just to to be able to, you know, remember that through all of the trials and tribulations of life in general and of like, you know, real horror and fear and um, atrocity and, um, you know, calamity that we have these principles that we try to live up to these practices that we try to abide by um, amidst it all. So um, it's been wonderful, the sense of connection and people signing up for the Zoom, people just sharing the idea, the platform. And a lot of it is even just in Burma. You know, we, the, the, the post we put on Facebook had between the Facebook post and the Instagram post, it's almost 20,000 likes. And they're almost all from Burma, from people inside, young and old. And, you know, just like people and, and, and this sort of real sense of gratitude and being seen and feeling this connection. And that's been so incredibly moving um, just to know that people know that we're connected and we're paying attention and we're trying something, you know, at this point. So we're just really happy to have you all here and, and whatever group continues to, to show up. Um, for what is really our, our normal Sunday offering, you know, a period of practice, Dhamma talk, of course, this will be in honor of what's happening right now in Burma, and um, we'll be focused on that th thematically, but um, just really good to, to be here with everyone and um, to feel that sense of heart connection and care, uh, as much as we may have other emotions, uh, of course, that naturally arise in response to something like this, to, to find our way back into caring as the, the central and um, most important value and hard experience that we hope can help guide us forward. Um, we're just really happy and appreciative that you're here with us today. So thank you. Um, and I'll hand it over to Steve who will offer um, a period of um, guided meditation instruction. And then after that, Michelle will offer some, uh, a talk Thanks, Jesse. the most loving and direct way to to connect with others uh, and to feel the, the the power of our metta the reaching out and holding holding others in kindness and care in serenity we first have to do that as best we can with ourselves. So to, to bring our, our systems, the bodily stream of sensations and the mental stream of thoughts, emotions, reflections, to a relative ease not looking for any perfection, just looking for stability, good enough stability. So what helps right now? What helps you do that? 
you take a few deep breaths, deep into the lungs, feeling it, feeling the sensations of that in-breath move throughout the body. And then with the exhalation, feeling the body just drop a notch into that stability, uh, into a sense of being grounded and anchored. Whatever predominant feelings or emotions might be up, assure yourself, assure our systems that we're making a space for that, making a shelter for those feelings and emotions and attend to them accordingly you know, as we're able to. For now, just the sense of emptying out and letting go feeling the body come into its own relative ease, and balance, relaxation. Not so affected by earlier emotions we may have had of elation or deflation. Right now in this moment is the power of mindfulness to influence a steady and easy stream of the body mind flow. And as the body relaxes into the posture, Just silently name the posture. So there's a direct relationship between knowing, the immediate knowing, and the experience of sitting or lying, standing. The more we feel this embodied anchor, groundedness. Then we can attend to the mind stream itself, the very focus of mindful awareness of the sense of present time, mindfulness, And you see how that has an immediate affect in soothing the mind stream, dispelling knots, tangles, stress, dis-ease, concern, desires, fears. And this allowing to come forward, tranquility, the tranquility we've learned how to access in meditation by sitting still, observing bodily sensations, observing the sensations as they appear and vanish in an in-breath, and again in an out breath. The light of awareness on the heart mind stream. Eases into the background 
any disturbing field, intrusion, agitation, distraction, and invites the calm, the mental ease, comfort, It was entering a sacred inner space. When we touch that, it feels like we're home. It feels like we've always known this place, place of peace and ease. So along, alongside the mindfulness stream is a closely connected companion, uh, even one of the expressions of mindfulness. Notice and see if you realize that kindness is already there a form, some form of the metta emotion, pure connection, pure love. The unconditionality of this quality of metta that's all inclusive, doesn't discriminate. So if we direct that first on ourselves, all the little areas in our own psyche that judge or feel shame, that feel inadequate about ourselves, just giving them the light of recognition and assuring them they're okay. Those old voices, those old hurts and pains and fears and longings and desires. This afternoon, we, we want to be able to use the metta and the karuna, compassion, for a very specific purpose. So beginning with ourselves to feel the, the confidence and the courage to have faith in ourselves just as we are and courage in ourselves just as we are at this moment. All the while, each time we breathe in and breathe out, there's mindfulness and kindness. Filling the body and filling, filling the heart. Continue with, with yourselves as a, a primary focus of mindfulness and a primary subject of metta. As long as you feel nurtured, as long as it feels it's having this, this affect instilling any inner disturbances and filling those places in us that have that confidence and courage and unconditional love and that pure 
almost precognitive, rare, mindful presence. And then during the next part where we're silent, you can uh, call up the image or felt sense of the people of, of Burma at this time. And let them reside in the heart, your heart. Feeling the same pure intention of unconditional love and pure awareness of ourselves just as we are. Include them in the heart family. The greatest gift of, of Burma in centuries is this practice that we're doing. So our gratitude for the home of, of this lineage and many others and has no limit and knows no depth.
in the last minutes of our sitting together. With an easy awareness wash, brushing, brushing through the body from head to toe. Pausing to feel here and there, feeling, feeling our heads on our shoulders. And feeling areas of warmth in the chest, solar plexus. upper back, and feeling in, in our limbs or arms or legs, sensations of solidity, sensations of fluidity. pressure and vibration. All through the lens of the kindness and awareness that we're practicing. Until awareness wraps around the whole body, mind, energy field Awareness with kindness, awareness with care, with appreciation and equanimity. The rare and precious vehicle of our body by which our thoughts, words, and actions can make a difference wherever and whatever we choose to attend to. <clears throat> Thank you, Steve, for the instructions and Jesse for the introduction today. Thank you. And Steve um, guided us into the uh, place in our chitta, the heart mind consciousness of the heart or mind heart where I'm pointing right now, the chitta consciousness. Um, we're in the human being uh, that this is a place of extraordinary sensitivity. It's, it's uh, capable 
of boundless loving kindness, for example, or uh, boundless peace or boundless compassion, empathetic joy and equanimity, wisdom. There's a patience. There's, there's so many um, aspects to the heart uh, that um, bring such goodness to the world and to our lives. And it's incredibly important for us to know that we can uh, cultivate the access, our access to these um, great spiritual emotions, great spiritual powers. And as uh, Jesse explained, it's like when the coup happened recently in Burma, I think that there was such a sense of um, after 50 years of living with a very harsh military rule that the last 10 years has brought some lightness to uh, Burma, not for, not for everyone by any means, um, but like a, a sense that there might be a gradual opening to more freedom and justice for all. Uh, but not, of course, we all know that the military has kept its harsh rule and how um, the genocide of the Rohingya, as well as the way that the, there's a hundred and actually 136 ethnic tribes in Burma, uh, but they say 135s because they don't even count the Rohingya. It's, uh, it's not an easy uh, situation as it was two weeks ago to navigate. But, but now I think there was a sense that what can we do? You know, what, what actually can we do? And, and I think that sense of um, when I went into Burma in 97, there was, there was such a sense of extreme isolation, extreme cultural and economic isolation, extreme poverty. Um, and th there are many ways that in this talk, I want to talk about what metta is and compassion is, but also, and peace with peace is, but also some of my experiences there. And I'm going to weave it back and forth rather than chunks of one or then the other. And uh, I remember the first time I went to teach in Burma, in Upper Burma, and after a month there, when I went to leave, a number of people, village people, monastics, um, dug their dug their fingernails into my arm very painfully very deeply and said are you coming back uh, and it was so intense it's like um, the level of isolation and the, the level of need to be seen just to be seen just to feel metta just to feel kindness uh, was so intense. And, and so when the, this coup happened, I think for those of us who have been there and have been there in the, the darkest times there, the, the bleakest, what I mean by dark is the bleakest times there. I think that this uh, terror that the people have of going back to that is so intense that um, what we wanted to do was to, you know, our goal has been to have people know there that we're thinking of them. As Jesse said, we're, we're sending them love and kindness as, as Steve guided. It's like that sense that um, they don't have to feel so alone. And I think that the sense that 20,000 people there said thank you with all the problems of the internet, uh, that, that was so remarkable to me, given 
what we wanted to happen. I thought, well, even if we don't have the Sunday sitting, it just to have that sense that, wow, that's a lot of people risking saying thank you. Risking, that's a risk. They say that um, what helps people the most in hell, and if you don't believe in hell, then when you think of your most bleak times in your lifetime, you know, the really harsh times, that it's metta, loving kindness, that helps us. And so I think just to, to remember that um, what we're wanting is for people to know that we're sending the metta and to remember that how that helps you when you're in your hardest times. That that's that that's the idea of this, that it's like holding the hand of someone who is terrified that they're gonna go back to that bleakness, to that isolation. And to let people know it doesn't have to be that alone, that bleak. And that's, that's a very, very um, pure wish, right? That, that we can offer. So another way to say that is with the loving kindness, we're feeling connected. We're feeling connected with kindness without conditions. So it's, it's not like, if, if this happens or if that happens or with, with this being or that being, or it's like all, all, the, all, all are suffering. And you, you know, there are times when we'll like open up the, the mind and heart to all the beings on our planet, right? Suffering, it, it doesn't have to be um, just the people of Burma at times, but then, you know, we open up we come back, we might feel a, a sense of wishing ourselves well or compassion for ourselves or our community, our country, our, our continent or the earth. It's like, it's very fluid as, as we've been, those of us who've been together the last month, um, it's that sense of it's more like a watercolor, this practice. But certainly I think uh, for myself, um, the discovery of affectionate awareness and how healing that is. Um, when I first started tasting it, it was so revolutionary. I remember I, we had a student um, that had been practicing Vipassana for 20 years and we introduced the metta practice um, at a retreat. For 20 years, he'd been doing Vipassana. And when he practiced the loving kindness and, and really touched into that quality of affectionate awareness, he said um, it had been like being really cold in the winter and standing in the sun, going out into the sun in the middle of the day when the sun was warm, but not feeling the warmth of the sun. Yeah, just, just, just get a felt sense of that again, like standing in the sun for 20 years, but not feeling the warmth. This is um, how different this quality of awareness is that you bring into the mindfulness. In fact, what's so interesting is that metta is mindfulness of metta. It's mindfulness, but it's mindfulness of loving kindness. And so that sense that if you think about, well, what does mindfulness mean? One definition is the intention to understand rather than to judge. The intention to understand our experience, allow our experience rather than to, ju to judge it. Then you see this possibility of the, the kindness, kindness softening the chitta, right? It softens the heart so that we can be with things as they are. This is from um, Tom Junot. He was a uh, very, he is, but at the time of this um, 
quotation, he was a very cynical uh, journalist with Esquire, and he was asked uh, to go interview Mr. Rogers. Uh, and he was known to have a very hard, <laughs> hard cynical heart. And um, this is what he wrote about being with Mr. Rogers. He said, what is grace? I'm not certain. All I know is that my heart felt like a spike. And then in that room with Mr. Rogers, it opened and felt like an umbrella. And, and we all know what that feels like. We all know what it feels like from going to a spike to an umbrella. Uh, and that's, that's the kindness that, that just softens and opens the heart. It's, it's love and kindness is considered the foundation of the, the opening and the softening of the heart so that we can have the courage to be with things as they are. This is what's so important. The love and kindness is what gives us courage to be with things as they are. And certainly when we offer love and kindness to the people of Burma, we're also offering the, the love and kindness in the, also with the hope of, of that giving courage, right? Of giving some sustaining power. Tom Jeannot also said about being with Mr. Rogers, this is a, a, not the direct quotation, but he said, instead of helping me get rid of my sadness, he helped me <clears throat> to understand my sadness. And, and again, what this is what loving kindness can do. It, it can help us whatever our experience, which is usually if it's something painful like loneliness, and, and, and in a way, I think that when we do the loving kindness practice in situations like what's happening in Burma, often we can't feel it. We can just kind of sit down and shift to, oh, sending loving kindness to everyone in Burma. But, but what is that? What is that? What's happening in the heart? And often if we go into the, the feeling, if the heart mind feels, it can often feel grief right? Or sadness, or anger, or rage, or, you know, the aloneness, or the loneliness, or whatever we, we have present in our own heart that is blocking the loving kindness. If that happens, we tend to encourage us all to do some compassion, care about those emotions, or be kind toward those emotions. And often if we can have interest and kindness with those emotions that are often difficult to feel, then we can feel the loving kindness. So it's, it's that's is also, it's not as, as Tom Juno said, it's not getting rid of the sadness. It's, it's coming to accept, to be interested, to understand, of course, of course we're gonna have a range of emotion in this, in this, um, in our lives, in the face of all of our lives, this range of joy and sorrow. Mm. I met uh, one of my uh, teachers, uh, incredible teachers, meditation teachers, was a woman from Calcutta, a lay woman named Deepama. Uh, and she had done her practice in Burma. And when we, um, have a sense of what we might be capable of in terms of loving kindness. Uh, she embodied that for me and she was like a lighthouse for me. It was like somebody that I could um, navigate my life around in terms of my, the potential of my own heart with loving kindness. And I knew, I knew she had been practicing in her lifetime in Burma and uh, this had a very deep effect on me. And what it, it felt like 
uh, because I think it's very important to know that our metta can, at times the loving kindness can feel like it can only be personal. And it might extend uh, very limited to the people who are easy and, and that really are easy to love or the beings like a, a, the, uh, a cat or a dog or a flower or the sky or uh, the ocean or a lake that all the things that tend to be easy um, we're meant to be practicing with. But what, what I experienced with someone like Deepama is that she had accessed something we all can access, but it was like she showered whatever she came in touch with, with loving kindness. It was like a, a shower of loving kindness blessing. And it, it, it was impartial. It, it wasn't like she chose to, to um, shower metta for one bird that she liked, but not another bird that she didn't like, or one person she liked, or another bird, a person that she didn't like. But it was like, it was unconditional for her. So inspiring. Just, it's... Um, something that we can't make happen but we don't realize that it's because we practice it that it can it can be like that it's like i think sometimes we feel like well if we're not born with it well we might as well forget it or how could i ever be like that but actually it's not like that it's more like we all know that the more we practice something, we be the better we get at it. And it doesn't mean that we don't go through a, a lot of difficulty. Like for example, um, even in our own country, things aren't exactly um, feeling at all stable in terms of kindness. It's an under it's we it's it's an understatement to say that. And so that that the sense that it isn't difficult to send love and kindness <laughs> to beings that are feel like they're causing um, a lot of dukkha problems is of course. And I, I'm looking for a quote because I was gonna do it at the end, but um, I'm gonna do it now. The sixth person to walk on the moon was a man named Edgar Mitchell, the late Edgar Mitchell. He was on the Apollo 14 mission. And it was, um, he said this after his uh, view from space, that this, this was a, a very humbling, a humbling experience he had from this view of, in space. He said, you develop, you develop an instant global consciousness, a people orientation, an intense dissatisfaction with the state of the world, and a compulsion to do something about it from out there on the moon. I think that's really important. It's like you develop an instant global consciousness from this perspective. <laughs> then he said, from out there on the moon, international politics, politics looks so petty. You want to grab a politician by the scruff of the neck and drag him a quarter of a million miles out and say, look at that, you son of a bitch. Excuse me, but um, that's a quote. <laughs> and so this, I think it's really important that we, that we, include that anger at how things are. Of course, we'll feel that. And that that's part of the journey we go through in cultivating loving kindness, unconditional love, that, that we, we go through that because we're so exasperated when we know what's possible, right? When we know what we're all capable of. And yet, 
it's to, to allow that and to find that softening of the heart with all beings on the planet. Because so many astronauts say that. They say, how could we not be peaceful? That you find peace just by looking at this jewel in space that is our home. That that inner peace just becomes obvious. It's not something you have to push or cultivate. It's just there. I think of when I when I think of this potential we have for kindness, I also think of the opposite, which is our vulnerability to kindness. Babies die without it. You know, human babies will die without not enough kindness. There was a, a great being George Jackson, who was in prison for so many years for nothing. <laughs> and um, he wrote a book, he wrote many books, but from Soldad Brothers, his letters from prison, he wrote, this is again a, a paraphrase, no one responds to kindness more than the desperate man. And we, we have to find that place in our own hearts so that we know that we know that in ourselves, that that's what we need when we're that desperate. And that we know that it's important to be able to offer that in whatever way we can at whatever moment by moment in our lifetime, that that's what heals. So we all share this vulnerability that's, you know, dukkha, <laughs> the second truth of existence. One of my teachers in this tradition, his name was Bhante Sivali from Sri Lanka. And I did um, a few days retreat with him when I worked at a meditation center as a cook. And I, I was going through a lot of, that was like the beginning of the lower back karma pain, 1979. And I went in to see him and I didn't know how much pain he was in. He was in excruciating pain. He died a little while after my interview with him. And I told him about this pain and um, he just was very kind. And I think of him, I always called him and my nickname for him was Mango Eyes. He had the, the mango, the sweetest kind, kind eyes. The kindness just went right through his eyes to me. And he said, oh, you mustn't be afraid of the pain. And do we remember that, right? That the times when there's so much pain, oh, you mustn't be afraid of the pain. And if we are, then there's the, all the tools we have of loving kindness, of compassion, of the mindfulness and the healthy distraction. And when we're at our best, I think we see so clearly that we don't need so much greed on the planet. We don't need so much greed inside of us. We don't need so much greed on the planet. And we don't need so much hatred on the planet or inside us. When, when we're clear, when we're accessing wisdom or metta, loving kindness, we know we don't need that hatred to protect us. We know we don't need as much as we think we might need. And we know we don't need delusion. We don't need to have this divisiveness and separateness. It's just an illusion, right? It's not, it's not true. It's not the truth. And it's often our naivete and our wishful thinking that we think that um, we need more.
and the human being, you know, our great journey is to be free of greed, hatred, and delusion. Yeah, it's like um, to be with things as they are, as they are. Uh, this is <laughs> this is peace. So when we say a meta phrase, just kind of going on that theme. May I be safe and protected from inner and outer harm, or may you be safe and protected from inner and outer harm. What are we saying? What are we safe and protected from? And as you go on in your life and practice the, the uh, loving kindness, you'll start to see that as your wisdom practice, your Vipassana practice develops, you see that what are we wishing ourselves and others? We're wishing ourselves and others to be free of greed, extra unnecessary greed, unnecessary hatred, unnecessary delusion. We're wishing this deep freedom of peace to be with things just as they are, that we, we live out karma together without the excess um, suffering, the unnecessary suffering. We wish that for everyone, everywhere. And I mean, it can sometimes be a selfish wish because we know if people are free of greed and delusion, they're not going to be causing so much harm, right? I mean, it, it has its um, practicality. It has its pragmatic reasoning. It's, it's not esoteric. It's extremely important. And, um, there's a lot more to be said about that, but I just wanted to um, add to that, just that to remember that if we can't, do all beings with the metta or we can't it kind of extend it out um, it's fine the practice is taught so that you have cultivated like an anchor an easy being that you or yourself if you're easy but you if you're not so easy you go to the easiest being you can connect with a child a friend an elder the sky, a tree, a tree from childhood, a little duck from childhood. It can be a bird. It can be any being. But that's part of the delight of, of loving kindness practice is that the means and the ends are the same. It's like you just go to where the metta is. You keep going to where you can connect with it because it's not a met. You can't force it. And if you can't do it, fine. <laughs> you know, you just stop. Just do the mindfulness work. You know, well, there's options. Steve, uh, Steve went into Burma twice uh, in the early years, three times actually, but two times to ordain as a monk. And the second time in 1995, um, he was allowed to go up to where we have had the three week retreat up in Upper Burma at Chazwa Monastery. To go, he was allowed up there for a month and he sat, uh, did a retreat for a month with an, a very wonderful monk named Uzinji in a cave. Um, and I'm, I'm trying to do this story short. Uh, but this, um, at that time, even when I went in 97, a lot of the young women were doing very hard labor, just like doing cement work, just uh, carrying the cement on their heads and going uphill. And their little sandals. And um, at that time, they would make 28 cents a day. Uh, and at some point in Steve's retreat with Uzinji, you know, she 
this village woman, she was 16, young woman, who was also one of the young women who dug her fingernails in my arm and said, please don't leave, to please come back um, after I left the first time. She offered Uzinji and Steve um, a soda pop. So each of those bottles of soda pop cost her a day's wage which of course her family needed, but she felt such a really beautiful metta for um, their practice. That's part of the joy of practicing in Burma is that sense of um, this respect, respect for our practice, our meditation practice. And from there, um, Steve became interested, of course, and what was going on for village people and the low wages and the poverty and learned that the school for the elementary school kids was flooding many months of the year. They needed a new school and, and a lot of child labor. A lot of the kids weren't able to go to school. And so this was the beginning of our Metadana project there um, to try to offer in one part of Burma, of course, it's like we can't fix everything, but you do your best in one area. I think that's what we hoped for. And continue with that um, wish. It's why it's hard not to be able to send money in right now, uh, but we have to protect it. So when I went in, it was because uh, Steve wasn't allowed in. He was blacklisted from getting to know Aung San Suu Kyi. And when I went in, um, Steve's mother decided to come. She was 87 years old and I'd never been to Burma or Asia. Uh, and I, I wanted to just share a few ways that I was touched by the love and kindness there. Um, just going into Burma my first time at security going into Rangoon uh, because I was with an 87 year old woman taking care of her, the waters parted. So it wasn't like, uh, it was an impartial respect for old people. I was treated with such respect that time I was in Burma. I was. I can't even tell you the feeling of what it was like. I mean, Steve's mother was treated with the utmost respect, but this is just how it it it, it is. You know, it might be changing, but it's um, it's like that a lot in Hawaii. It's why I love living here. There's an incredible respect for for the elderly. That first year, um, there was a curfew and uh, not much electricity. That's one of the things that has changed for people is that there's more electricity for, for village people and city people. So you would see across the river from Mandalay in the three week retreat, it was mostly blacked out there and it was blacked out, <laughs> um, of course, in the in the poor, poorer villages, uh, but I had uh, walked this young woman. Then she was eighteen, who had offered the soda pop. Um, this is before she was married and now has three children. I was walking her back to her home and her friend's home in the village, uh, but I didn't know about the curfew yet. It was early on in my time there, and then um, they realized that. I wouldn't necessarily be safe if I walked back by myself to the monastery. So I didn't know what it would be like for them walking me back, but it got, it started to get dark and the military came by and they didn't make it look like they were afraid to them, but their bodies went into just like rigor mortis. They were on either side of me and they froze and they were terrified just, terrified at the sight, just the sight.
And now I think I want to share one more thing about her and her family now, her husband and children. Um, a few days ago, they called on the phone, which felt like a miracle. And um, it's how things have changed there. And they were in a protest, the whole family, the kids, the whole family in this area. I just couldn't even believe there was a protest and the head of that state had just been jailed. And they had a gleam in their eye. This is what I wanna share. She and her husband had, and the kids, they had a gleam in their eye that I'd never seen before there. And it was like this pride and dignity and standing up for their rights. I, I, I can't even tell you, just like the, that aliveness, that spirit of like fighting for their rights, nonviolently, very proud. Um, this is something no matter what happens, that there are so many people there standing up for their rights is so moving. And uh, I didn't, it was sort of like a reverse of my experience with her <laughs> where she froze. I froze because I was so afraid for the, the, the kids and the family. And um, yesterday she texted that she's terrified. You know, it's like, and, and it's all was in her eyes. It's like in that brief moment of contact over the phone, I could see the, the joy of, of the dignity and the pride of being able to protest and also the terror of protesting. Uh, and this is it, right? This range of joy and sorrow that we all face as human beings on this planet and that the sense of, um, what we can do with our loving kindness and peace that we can bring the, this goodness to the world. Uh, how fortunate we are where we live for, for not all of us, but a lot of us feel like we can have that right, but it's in danger, great danger. So I know it's a little long, but I want to end with a, a quote by Martin Luther King from his uh, March 25th, 1965, Selma, Alabama, right to vote, right? Still, still, we're still at it, the right to vote, Bloody Sunday. And he said, how long will prejudice blind the visions of men? I come to say to you this afternoon, however difficult the moment, however frustrating the hour, it will not be long because truth crushed to earth will rise again. How long? Not long because no lie will live forever. How long? Not long. Because you shall reap what you sow. How long? Not long. May we be safe and protected from inner and outer harm. Thank you, Michelle. Hmm. And we thought um, maybe the best way to end today, instead of doing questions with such a large group, 
um, that we could just chant a metta chant together. Um, I think just as Steve was saying, and you know Michelle alluded to, there's there's no end to the depth of our gratitude. It's inconceivable, you know. Um, how much we have all benefited from these teachings, you know, that have been preserved for so many centuries in Myanmar and of course other places. Um, and I think that, you know, we all feel so deeply that the, the most important way to honor that is, um, is through that deepening commitment to, to what we've received, to what we've learned, to, to how it has helped us, to how it has helped so many others. And so um, to be able to spend a, a few moments uh, offering that in voice as well. So it's like uh, had been mentioned of moving, you know, from the, the heart and mind into bodily action, into physical action, vocal action, speech. Um, this is a part of that process. And so, um, we thought it would be a good way to end our, our time together here. Um, the chant that we have been doing is a version of a um, chant you'll hear all around Burma and, and elsewhere um, in the Pali language of loving kindness in particular. And the, the, the intention is of course that it just be spread as far and wide and in all realms uh, that are, we can imagine and are conceivable. Um, so whether you're you know, used to our chant and, and this one, you will know versions of this uh, for sure. Um, and so we'll do it uh, call and response um, together. And just taking that time, taking that time to attune to the sense of caring again, this quality of love and kindness, the beautiful aspiration we have for the well being of all, the welfare of all. In particular, right now, of course, this, this concern or this focus of our concern around Myanmar and the, the many different peoples there and cultures and traditions and um, the vibrancy of that place. And that one of its many gifts is, is that, yes, that it has preserved these teachings so powerfully and, and lives and breathes them. And so may we live and breathe it as well. So I'll chant line by line and um, I'll just pause after I chant it to make sure everyone has the time and we'll just go through it. Aham awero homi Abhya pajo homi Anigo homi Sukiyatanam Hari Harami Sabe Sata Sabe Pana Sabe Buta Sabe Pugala Sabe Atambawa Pariya Pana Saba Itio Sabe Purisa Sabe Ariya Sabe Anaria Sabe Dewa Sabe Manusa Sabe Winipatika 
Awedahontu Abhya Panja Hontu Aniga Hontu Sukiyatanam Pari Harantu Dukkha Muchantu Yata Lada Sampatito Mawinga Chantu Kamasaka Purati Maya Desire Pachi Maya Desire Uttaraya Desire Dakinaya Desire Purati Maya Anu Desire Pachi Maya Anu Desire Uttaraya Anu Desire Dakinaya Nudisaya Eti Maya Desire Upari Maya Desire Udam Yawa Mawagacha Ado yawa awi chito Samanta chako alisu Yesata patawi chara Abya paja ni cha Ni dukkha cha nu padawa Udam yawa mawaga cha Adu yawa awi chito Samanta cha kawalesu Yesatau dake chara Abhya Paja Niwera Cha Nidukka Cha Nupadawa Udam Yawa Mawaga Cha Adu Yawa Awi Chito Samanta Cha Gawalesu Ye sata kase chara Abhya paja ni vera cha Ni dukkha cha nu padawa Udam yawa mawaga cha Adu yawa awi chito Samanta chako alesu Yesata agichara Abhya paja ni vera cha Ni dukkha cha nu padawa Ada imaya pati padaya Jara Maranama Parimuchi Sami Idame Punyang Asawaka Yawahang Hotu
Idang me silang, maga pala nyanyasa, pachayo hutu. Imano punya bagang, sabasatanang dema. Sabe sata sukita hondu. Sadu, sadu, sadu. Mm. Well, thank you again for joining us today. Um, it's felt really important to do. Um, and I, I do really, I feel the goodness of it very deeply. And I think it'll be uh, good to share with our friends um, to have them know that we've done it and they'll be able to watch the recording of course and stuff on Facebook or whatever, as well as anyone who, um, and on YouTube, our, our YouTube channel, if anyone is interested in sharing. Um, we will, um, uh, before we go, I will, I will post a few links uh, here on the chat of some websites that I feel like have been helpful in the last couple of weeks in terms of keeping up to date on some of the news and what's happening. Um, if anyone else has other resources that you wanna share and put a link in the chat, we can do that and we can share it with this list afterwards. Um, and, um, you know, we will be in touch if there's anything, you know, sort of, we'll sort of take the lead of, of you know, people on the ground in Myanmar about what, how we might be able to support the, the movement in a way that is meaningful, that is um, tangible, but that's also kind of, you know, rooted on, on, I'm sensitive to what's happening right now in the moment. And it's a very, you know, changing every day, the, the dynamic. Um, and it's, you know, just as everyone has said, it's like, we're, we're, we have both this mix of just like inspiration and awestruck and how moving it is to see so many people and so joyous. I mean, it's like one of the things about this, the protests that have been happening, if you've seen, you know, there's so much of it is very playful and humorous and, um, spontaneous and light and and just sort of like uplifting um, as well as angry and as well as indignant and as well as all those other things. Um, and so there feels like there's just a lot of hope. And we also know that there's a lot of fear and there's a lot of good reason to be fearful. And um, so we have that mix in our hearts, of course. Um, and, and of course, we have that hope that we'll be able to get back uh, next year with the pandemic gone and the democracy restored and, and we hope that you can all join us at Chazwa Monastery uh, for our wonderful retreat that we have there with our teachers, our Burmese monastic teachers and our Western lay teachers and the community there. And um, it's, you know, a really wonderful way to be able to experience the tradition and the cultural that supports that tradition um, and the reality of life there. And, and we do hope that, you know, soon we'll be able to um, go back and, and um, have those, um, you know, more, more human physical bonds, uh, you know, again, soon. Um, of course, we hope that for everywhere in the world after a year of social isolation, but uh, in particular, we're, we're looking forward to being able to go back and um, do that. So may it be so, you know, that this, this movement, um, flourishes and blossoms and the goodness of it really transforms the dynamic of what's possible and that even a, a more flourishing democracy than um, they had is, is, is within sight. So um, we'll, we'll try to keep you informed of the ways that we can all help support. And um, yeah, we hope you find ways of, of also supporting and learning about what's happening and sharing, sharing them with us as well. So we can help you a vehicle for that um, in the coming weeks and months. So yeah, Michelle, yeah. Steve, I don't know if there's anything else you want to add. I wanted to uh, thank Steve for getting me to Burma <laughs> by not being allowed in there and uh, having a years there with you there and out, without you there and Jesse for carrying it on, carrying the spirit of that retreat on so well. And I, you know, I just think that um, 
we, we all carry these teachings on, whether we uh, go there or go, go, go back, but it's like, um, it's really about the love and kindness and peace and wisdom. So we're very fortunate to all be together. And Steve, do you have anything to add? No. I was just remembering during your talk about Burmese people's their lightness, their respect for elders, and so forth. The year that the late Paul Reps lived here with us, the iconoclastic and irreverent Zen master at age 87, who had gone to Burma and India in his teenage years. And he, he would often remark that having traveled around the world, the Burmese were the happiest people in the world. Uh, and uh, I feel the same, I always have. And uh, that also is a powerful force. That's an aspect of their metta nature and their appreciative mudita nature. <clears throat> so it makes it easier to feel hope and help any way we can help the happiest people in the world. And yeah, again, thanks, Jesse, for organizing this because it wouldn't have happened without you. And thank you, Steve, for all. Thanks. So, yeah, thank you. Jesse, thanks, Michelle. Yeah. And thanks, everybody. Mm -hmm. Boy, and I the like Zoom that. remains I, open yeah. for, you know, till I think we're almost the last time zone on the planet to see the end of the day. So feel free to stay or come back uh, in this evening and, and keep practicing. Yeah. I love that 24 hour Zoom room. It's great. Mm. Once I figured out that people could see me, even if my video was off. <laughs> <laughs>